Hello everyone, it is Joe here from OmniPoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. If you're looking for PTCGO codes, including the stuff from Vivid Voltage, make sure you go ahead and check out the Town store. You can get a 5% discount on your orders using that code OmniPoke. For today's video, I'm going over my Champions Cube run. On the channel already, you can see my thoughts about the cube, where we go over some of the most powerful combos available, and you can also see how I drafted but today I'm going to go over the deck that I ended up constructing and do a quick round by round uh, of how the tournament went. So first of all, let's look at my deck. If any of you saw the draft, I did get a few lucky moments in there, but also a few awkward decisions at the same time. Uh, the best slice of luck really was that I was able to access both Garchomp C level Xs in the draft. And this is one of the most powerful cards in the draft. I was really, really highly prioritizing SP Pokemon anyway because the specific rules of this cube meant that if you draft the level X, you automatically get two copies of the accompanying basic. So yes, you can see a 4-2 line of Garchomp C in the draft, because one other stipulation is that you weren't limited to the number of copies of um, a card with the same name in your deck either. So unlike the old previous SP rules where the level X counted to the same name as Garchomp C, so a 2-2 line was the thickest you could get, I was able to play a 4-2 line, which was absolutely insane. And that was really the crutch of the deck. I was trying to use Dragon Rush as much as possible. Anyone who plays Cube knows that being able to access bench Pokemon in those opening turns is one of the most scariest things you can do. This draft had very limited gusting options, um, just things like Counter Catcher and Power Hand Extension. I think there was one or two Pokemon gust effects, but very, very limited overall. So having this sniping option to deal with um, basically every basic SP Pokemon, every basic evolving Pokemon, and a number of stage one evolving Pokemon um, was just insane pressure that I could put all over the board. <clears throat> because I got the first Garchomp in pack two, I was able to quite heavily commit to this, and I was able to pick up all of the DCE style effects as well, which meant that I could chain Dragon Rushes between both my Garchomps a reasonable, amount, a reasonable amount, which was really, really powerful. Once again, just being able to basically select and cherry pick your opponent's side of the field is a very powerful effect to have. So in some ways it was a high roll that I saw these Garchomps, um, but it was definitely one of the things that I was prioritizing going in. I was also able to get Claydol and Staraptor FB level X, so I had a good amount of draw, especially for this cube. Um, there was a 3-2 Claydol line, a 3-2 Delcatty line. There was one Staraptor FB level X in the draft. Um, there was a Porygon 2 that has the backup ability. And I think that's the main options uh, for draw power that just sort of sits on your board and gets value compared to some other cards that can um, draw you sort of in one-off situations like Uxy and Shaman and those sorts of things. Um, so yeah, I got a really good chunk of the draw power and I also think that really did help me out uh, throughout the draft. Some interesting things about the deck. Uh, I actually had no uh, switch outs, but I had, what is it? I think it's 10 free retreat Pokemon or things that could become free retreaters. So I was able to navigate uh, navigate that fairly well. I had the four Garchomps, the two Staraptors, three Poochiennas, and the Weavile G that could all become free retreaters or naturally had free retreat, which uh, made it quite easy for me to move around my attackers as well, which is something that's underrated in cube. I think retreat cost actually is a huge deal, especially in a cube like this where status is a, another huge factor. Both burn and poison were some very powerful effects in the draft. I was able to take advantage of that with uh, my second pick of the draft was actually Skuntank G, which I highlighted straight away as one of the strongest enablers uh, for poison, which is really, really big in this draft because uh, most damage output attacks were around that sort of 60 to 90 kind of mark. So doing three counters between turns with poison was pretty much disgusting when I was coming up to any non-SP deck. Um, so that was definitely a big factor as well for the draft. Picking up both Furbanks as well, very, very nice. So overall, my draft went pretty good. I think there was a few things that I missed here and there, but overall the deck was okay. Some rough um, situations where I had to give up some other good basic attackers. I had to give up on a lot of good supporter cards. You'll see most of my supporters are actually kind of like mid to low tier supporters. I think some of the strongest ones I have is like Winona, specifically good for my deck. Um, Cyrus is quite a good card. Uh, Gladion is a fairly high priority pick, but most of these are kind of the, the mid tier supporters, mid to low tier, actually. I don't have anything like uh, Professor Juniper, N, 
uh, Rocket's Admin, any of those kind of cards for huge draw. Nothing like um, Stevens or Erica's either. So yeah, a ton of a ton of kind of mediocre supporters essentially being knitted together by the fact that I had Claydol to be that supporter per turn, essentially, and also Star Raptor being able to cherry pick the right one for the right situation was kind of the idea there. But yeah, ultimately, um, trying to make the most of that poison, my Tiena being a free and a zero energy attacker when I poisoned it, which I was able to do with Skun Tank quite easily, meant that, uh, yeah, he can come in, he would be booting something really for 80 damage or 110 if they weren't an SP Pokemon. Yes, he would take three damage and potentially six damage, and I'd just retreat him to the bench. But the idea was I already had Mr. Fuji in the deck, which could reset that Mightyena to like throw him back into the deck, or just um, I could come in again and try and double down Mightyena and something else at the same time by poisoning it once more. Um, so yeah, he was also very nice because there was obviously going to be off turns that I had uh, where I wasn't able to chain Dragon Rush just because I didn't have access to another DCE or I had used it the previous turn and didn't have both in play or just didn't have enough energy for it. So yeah, the Mightyena was a nice option to have in here. On reflection, I think I could have gone without the Mightyenas altogether because these two Cold Feet Mightyenas were in both in one pack in the last pack of the draft. Um, so I had to pass on some very, very decent cards just to take both of these Mightyenas thinking that I wouldn't have enough attacking options. But if I had actually drafted slightly differently and um, prioritized a few other things, I could have just gone without this Mightyena altogether and just had more energy acceleration options. Um, so yeah, one of those things where I think the Mightyena was okay for me throughout the tournament, um, but it certainly could have been a different way of building this deck as well. I could have been pure SP in uh, in many regards. So <clears throat> that's just something interesting going into the draft. But yeah, I highlighted Garchomp C as one of the most powerful cards to pick. I was able to get both of them. Uh, so overall, a pretty good uh, deck, I thought, um, for for the options out there, at least. So <clears throat> some improvements that I could have made, just straight away from the things that I actually drafted. Um, there's some things that I would have liked to change in hindsight. And that's because, I mean, firstly, I've never drafted this cube before. So it was like a brand new experience for me, and I didn't prioritize things necessarily perfectly. Um, but I think... Just a few kind of rookie mistakes, really. I played, I think it was 11 energy cards in total with that special charge to get back the twin energies. And I think just having Castaway and an extra fair energy in the deck would have made a lot of sense for me. Uh, it would have gave, given me more opportunities to Lusamine back Mina to spam it more often, which I basically wasn't ever able to do because I'd usually drawn into too many fair energies or like prized one here or there. there. So I could only use Mina once for my acceleration. So having an extra copy that could have been in the deck and having cast away to be an extra search for an energy card um, was something that I actually undervalued because there was many turns I actually went with uh, missing an energy drop. And a lot of the time I was using things like Opal um, and Gladian just to get manual attachments per turn so I could keep up in that game so I could try and spam that Garchomp as much as possible on the turns that I needed to. So I took a number of kind of off turns where I was just hitting for 30, hitting for 50 with Earthquake on the regular Garchomp C. Um, because I'd missed some energy drops here and there. So I definitely should have prioritized those and actually put them in the deck. These are these four cards to include are ones that I did draft, but just didn't end up into my actual 60. Black Belt was also one. I, I understand why I didn't put Black Belt in, because I'm normally trying to be high tempo and aggressive. Um, but there was some scary things out there that I could have been able to get over all in one turn if I'd had that Black Belt and sort of let myself go behind. There were some really annoying... Um, SP Pokemon that I couldn't ever one-shot because the Skuntank wasn't active to poison them. Um, so I would have had a much easier run if I had had Black Belt here for a number of the SP matchups, which was popular. I expected it to be popular because I knew that the SPs were going to be strong because they're just naturally competing with the Stage 2s in this draft in terms of their stats and their damage output. So the Black Belt would have been a nice get-out-of-jail-free option, especially with Star Raptor. so I should have considered that. And also I went in with no copies of Dangerous Drill. Now, the things that I was going to remove from the draft, like it would be getting rid of a Sableye and a Puchiena, so I would have had less outs, but I still would have had the 2-2 Mightyena line and the Weavile G that I could have had for Dangerous Drill. And the reason why I desperately needed Dangerous Drill was tools are really, really insane in this draft, and I kind of underestimated that. Specifically, Cessation Crystal was extremely scary for my deck because I was often reliant on Skuntank, Bronzong, and the healing effects 
um, the healing breath of Garchomp C level X as well. And obviously Claire Dolan and Star Raptor, if they were in play, they were big parts of my draw engine. My supporters were all subpar. So I basically stopped drawing cards as soon as Cessation, uh, Cessation Crystal hit the field. So having an out with Dangerous Drill would have been nice. Um, I uh, didn't have any easy ways to search the Dangerous Drill necessarily, even with the supporters that I picked up. Um, but yeah, that was, uh, that was a card that definitely should have made its way into my deck. And the cards on the top, the Danner, I only faced one stage two deck in the entire draft. The idea was that Danner could just be a, a tutor to DCE, which I thought was like the most powerful card in my deck, which is certainly true. Um, it was enabling so many good attacking options and I could build attackers out of nowhere, essentially. Uh, so the idea was if there was more stage two decks around, I could have used Dana to great effect. Turns out I actually didn't use Dana once in the entire tournament. So it was a constant brick for me, <laughs> which was uh, very, very bad actually. And I should have known this really because when I did my own evaluation, uh, there was a number of stage two lines that I was personally going to ignore. I thought Kingdra, Ampharos and Kabutops were all fairly underpowered. Um, so I actually should have foreseen this coming. And also just with my own deck, seeing as though I'm a rush style deck and I'm trying to drag and rush the main threats on the bench a lot of the time, it means that I actually stop my opponent getting into stage two Pokemon quite often, even if I face those matchups. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely shouldn't have drafted. Well, I could have drafted Dana, but just not put her in my deck. Uh, the Poochiana, just because, uh, I didn't need that thick of a line for my Tiana. The Alolan Vulpix and the Sableye are interesting, actually. Um, even though Alolan Vulpix is a free energy attacker, I would have still had to spend an energy to retreat out of Alolan Vulpix, and the same can be true for Sableye. I did actually use both these cards uh, throughout some of my games, so it's not like they were absolutely terrible, but they just don't go to the main strategy of this deck, which is like early aggressive damage output. Just give myself higher odds of starting with Garchomp, give myself higher odds of starting with Staraptor, uh, those are, you know, some of the best leads and Puchienas were all reasonable leads because I could evolve and become a free retreater out of that. So just these early game starters actually weren't good for me oftentimes because they just um, took away a lot of my pressure. And that was really the selling point of this archetype. So um, having to think about cards, you know, cards like these are obviously very good. And most people would have bitten your hand off to have Beacon or Junk Hunt in certain situations. Um, and that's why I prioritize them, just because knowing that these are strong cards in a vacuum, they didn't actually synergize with the deck quite as well. So they didn't function how I liked. Um, so they shouldn't have made it into the final list. So even from the cards that I drafted, I could have had four cards better to make this deck even stronger. There was a few other moments that I had in the draft where I think I, like looking back, I made a couple of mistakes. There was an early pack where I passed a Karina and took like a meaningless or like speculative uh, basic or stage one. I think it was a Porygon at the time uh, when I'd already got a speculative Porygon <laughs> kind of thing. Um, and I should have taken that Karina. Um, Karina is just good item search in general. Could have just played it as an almost Skylar. But then I eventually rolled into Claydol and then it would have been absolutely insane for my deck to have that uh, Karina in there. Uh, so that was definitely a missed opportunity. I think also uh, midway through the drafting thing, I found the Bronzong G and immediately after that point, I should have prioritized Dark Patch like really, really highly. I think I let two or three slip past me after the Bronze. I think it was two slip past me after I'd already picked up Bronzong G. Now I had already picked one Dark Patch just to have. Um, I think I got it like late passed to me in a pack, um, but I and I ended up putting Dark Patch in my deck and it was one of my stronger cards actually. Um, but yeah, I should have prioritized those dark patches a lot more because they synergize so well with Weavile G and then Bronzong can move them around onto Garchomps. So it was a great way to recycle a fairly low energy count that I had, recycle those um, and just have really insane board presence. So definitely should have prioritized those dark patches. Seeing as though I ended up playing Mina, which was essentially a supporter version of dark patch, but from the deck, uh, should tell you that I would have liked to see a you know, a second copy of Dark Patch, maybe even a third copy of Dark Patch into the deck. Even though I only have one target for it, I had decent Pokemon recovery with um, the Pokemon Retriever from Team Rocket Returns, which is essentially a rescue stretcher. Uh, and I also had um, Time Space Distortion, which is three coin flips. So on average, I could get back that Weavile if ever it was targeted or if ever I discarded it for any reason. So yeah, I should have prioritized those Dark Patches. So my deck could have been slightly better um, than it actually was if I just uh, drafted a little bit differently. One funny thing was I actually uh, misread how Heatran level X worked. I thought it was a way to loop Garchomp, but it only works for fire and metal Pokemon, which I found out later. Uh, <laughs> 
Uh, so yeah, just a, a small thing, but regardless, I still should have been taking the dark patches over the Heatran because I hadn't actually drafted any switch outs, so Heatran was never going to work anyway because I needed him on the bench. So yeah, just a few things. If you actually watch the draft, um, yeah, I, I could have drafted a little bit better. I think for the most part, the draft went well for me and I did well in difficult situations for a couple of packs, let some good cards slip. Uh, but yeah, there was certainly one or two things that I look back and think, my deck could have been a little bit stronger if I'd made a couple different decisions. Overall, though, very powerful deck. Best, uh, one of the best attackers, if not the best attacker in the actual draft, uh, was Garchomp C, in my opinion. Um, so being able to have a super thick line of that was just inherently advantageous. Um, so there was a ton of strong things my deck was able to do. The main weaknesses were the damage output was very poor when I wasn't able to poison things with Skun Tank, either if they're not an SP Pokemon or if they were playing uh, forms of... Um, ability lock or po uh, power lock, uh, which was normally in the form of cessation crystal or like Ampharos, something like that. Um, so that was definitely a big issue for the deck. A lack of tool removal made me even weaker to cessation crystal because my deck basically turned off as soon as I saw it. Uh, a lack of hand disruption. This is mostly in the supporter category. I think I could have even picked up a um, Team Rocket's no, what is it? Team Galactic's Wager. That's the card, which is um, play rock, paper, scissors with the opponent. The winner draws six, the loser draws three. Um, I think that was actually a reasonable pick for me because I had zero hand disruption. Um, obviously, all the good ones were taken already, um, but I think there was opportunity for me to draft uh, Wager. And I, in hindsight, should have picked it um, because there were certainly some matchups where I could have won if I just win that Wager. Uh, and even if I lose that wager and give them a fresh six card hand, there were some scary combos that people were able to build up in hand against me, which I feel like I, if I could have knocked off course, I still could have found ways to win and make it difficult for them. So yeah, that was a small missed step and something I'll value much higher in the draft in future. Uh, and a lack of switch outs. I think um, I didn't actually see many switch outs. I, I chose a time space distortion over a switch at one point. I think that was one of the only opportunities that I thought was a good time to pick switch. Um, but yeah, not playing any of those was a shame. I would have much preferred to have picked up like Tate and Liza, which is obviously a super high power card, um, or Olympia, one of those things, because I already had Star Raptor. But yeah, I think uh, that was one of the only other things that could have made my deck a little bit stronger. That, like, looking through my draft, I don't think there was many opportunities for me to get them. Um, but those are just the glaring weaknesses of how the deck was built. So if you want to follow along the round by round that I'm about to go over, many of these games were actually streamed on the P3 podcast on Twitch. Um, this is a really awesome uh, group of guys running the uh, the Cube League. It's um, It was a casted tournament over two weekends, a Cube Championships uh, day one and day two. Um, so yeah, you can, you can see all the action. There was a ton of games. I think there was even a draft, um, that was recorded, which you can also watch on their YouTube channel, just P3 podcast. Uh, they're relatively new. They also obviously do podcasts. So you can check them out on Spotify as well. I'm not sure what other mediums that they do use for podcasting, but I just listen to them on, um, on Spotify and they're doing a brilliant series where they're really introducing people who are new to Cube. So if you want to listen to those podcasts, they give a ton of great beginner information for you. They also do a great section, which is cracking a pack each week, which I think is fun to listen to the thought process of two different drafters and what they sort of value, which could also uh, help, you out of, uh, help you out a lot, which is cool. And I believe they're also starting to put some of the gameplay on their um, YouTube channel as well from the stream. So you may be able to watch some of the games uh, without having to skip through the sort of gaps that were going on during the stream. So yeah, just a quick shout out to them. I have no association with them other than like, I kind of know the guys <laughs> because I've played with them before. Um, but yeah, the guys running the podcast is uh, amazing. And yeah, definitely check out their Twitch and YouTube. Just a quick nod to them because I personally love listening to their <laughs> their podcast each week. Uh, so just let's give them guys, let's give them some uh, some more views and give them a reason to do it every week. On to uh, round one then. So I was beginning, I was a low seed for the Champions Cube because I only played in like one tournament for this. And I, I got a top four, which then got me enough points to get into the Champions Cube in the first place. But it meant that I was in like the first round of the winner's bracket where a few people who were in higher seedings had a round one buy essentially. But amazingly, my round one was a mirror of sorts. I was really interestingly surprised by this. So 
you can see here, my opponent was able to draft uh, Garchomp, Staraptor. They had Cold Feet, Mighty Enna, and uh, their poison uh, option was Ariados rather than Skuntank. And they also had Honchkrow in as an alternative attacker. In many ways, their deck was just like a less consistent version of mine, I guess you could say. Not less consistent in terms of supporters. Their supporters are clearly better than mine. Um, but less consistent at getting that poison off in the opening stages, less consistent at spamming Dragon Rush, and just, you know, because they played a 1-1 Garchomp and a 1-1 Staraptor, and obviously no Claydol, they just had less options than I did a lot of the time. I was normally getting into Fast Call and getting into uh, Bron uh, Claydol, I should say, a lot faster. Um, so it just meant that I had um, better hands than them most of the time, despite having, you know, really good supports on their end. And you can see that they've gone for a very similar thing as me here. They weren't able to pick up Verbanks. They weren't able to pick up um, Skuntank, which probably really did hurt them and their damage output. Um, but yeah, I don't remember much of these games other than I was just in in general having better hands than them just based on my draw engine. Um, and Garchomp can be oppressive at times when you're just literally just picking things off on the bench. I think I remember they had early, like, Mighty Enna plays against me, and I was just using uh, Garchomp to kill Arados, which then makes the Mighty Enna pretty useless kind of thing. So, yeah, I think those are the big takeaways from this deck. But it was cool to see someone else drafting a very similar thing to me. And if you're thinking, like, how did I get both Garchomps, and then uh, this player has also got Garchomp, there was actually uh, three different pods of uh, the draft, uh, three seven-player pods, um, who were all obviously doing the same draft at once. So I was in a different pod to uh, AS Robertson and they were able to pick up these pieces, whereas in my group of seven, I was able to pick up all the Garchomp pieces as well. So I thought it was hilarious that two people basically had the same idea for this and how differently they ended up uh, being. But yeah, very jealous of their supporter line. <laughs> but uh, in the end, I was able to come out on top just with a thicker Garchomp essentially. In round two, we had Slight. Slight was the highest seeded player uh, for the Champions draft. So for all the cubes that have been going on um, throughout the Cube League season, Slight has been accumulating the most points. So clearly um, a co an accomplished drafter and player. They were playing uh, Honchcrow Lucario. You can actually see his full draft on their P3 podcast. Um, and yeah, he's trying to use that, uh, that Weavile to turn Lucario into a Dark type so he could take advantage of the Dark Claw and the special Dark Energies that he was able to pick up throughout the draft. Every player at the beginning of the draft gets four special Darkness Energies <laughs> uh, for free. Um, so that's that tells you why there are so many special Darks in the last two players' lists, for sure. Um, but yeah, this is Slight's Cube, the deck that we're actually playing. So I know he would have had good knowledge of what he thought was powerful and has probably played this before once or twice. Again, their supporters far outweigh mine. Um... They don't have the best draw engine cards. They have Porygon 2, which is pretty okay. But again, I can always target that if I need to. I think uh, the story of Slight and my games were just early aggressive. <laughs> um, Garchomp was just way too much uh, for him to sort of deal with. I think I was able to pick off early attachments that he was, you know, he was Weaviling energies around the board. I was able to like poison the Weaviles and whatever else was active, do a ton of pressure with Skuntank whilst also sniping bench Pokemon. And essentially, whenever I'm not up against an SP deck, I was my damage output was just absolutely insane because the Skun Tank plus the Bench Snipe combination was just way too much pressure for people to deal with. So yeah, really, really solid matchup for me, I think, overall. The PCL could have been awkward for me, but I just don't think he ever had it in hand at the right times. Um, so yeah, some early games against him and uh, won that Series 2-0. I also won the, the first round 2-0 uh, as well. In round three, we're up against Blue. Blue is a fellow SP player. Um, and certainly a scary matchup. We had a pretty good uh, series, actually. Uh, some interesting players with uh, Absol G Level X, which certainly threw a spanner in the works. Uh, it has the poker power that allows you to flip three coins when it comes into play. For each heads, you get to put the top card of your opponent's deck into the loss zone. And uh, in game two, he Absol G Level X'd me on turn two, and he lost zoned a DC and a special charge, which is super duper scary and made game two like super long and uh, a difficult grind for me resource wise, because losing essentially three of my DCs when I'm trying to drag and rush things down is is very, very scary. Um, but yeah, that Absol did a lot of work in both the series, actually, that Darkness Slugger that he was just spamming essentially for good damage output. The good news is a lot of his attackers stay out of range of Garchomp, so I was able to healing breath quite a lot. Um, you can see this was like much thicker SP 
Um, but their attackers basically are just less efficient than Garchomp a lot of the time. The biggest things I had to be afraid of was Ditto could obviously transform into a Garchomp and hit me straight back. So I had to be a little bit concerned about that, especially because there was good energy acceleration on their side. They did have two DCs. They did have uh, EXP share as well as Aqua Patch and two Dark Patch. So a ton of ways that they could get energies into play and start bronzonging them around uh, much like to really good effect. Um, so those were the big nuances there. Um, I think really it came down to, again, just a lack of draw engine and the Pokemon side of things. Their support account was a little bit lower than most, I would say. They had the cut, the double castaway and Cyrus, which is essentially three copies of Cyrus. Uh, if you're able to actually, no, it was just getting energies and supporters with the castaway, but the Cyrus getting, uh, SP radars and stuff was cool. Uh, they were smart enough to put the drill in their deck as well, which was an oversight on my part. So yeah, uh, we had some interesting games. I think a lot of the time it was um, protect the ditto and um, try and weave in the ditto at certain points. And I was able to just deal with it one one or two times uh, quite efficiently. I had to attack with um, Staraptor FB level X quite a lot um, just because I was afraid of ditto coming in and smacking my Garchomp. So I had to dodge and weave a little bit with that. But yeah, uh, some close games there and uh, it was a fun series. I really like SP Mirrors um, because it was much more interesting than me just going like Scun Tank Snipe, Scun Tank Snipe kind of thing. Uh, it made me work a lot more for these games, which is pretty cool. Uh, in at round four, I was up against Mike Gibbs. Mike was also playing that Honch Crow Lucario combination that we saw Slight play. Um, so I believe these guys talked about the cube beforehand and talked about powerful combos. So it was clearly on people's radar to try and draft. Uh, this style of deck. Now, game one against Mike was very, very sad for me. They actually started off with the Night Song Murkrow, which I just didn't read turn one, and I definitely should have read this card, <laughs> because this card is disgusting and basically made me lose the first game against him on the spot, because I just benched a Bronzong G, and Night Song gusts up whatever you want on your opponent's bench. Uh, so I only play one poker turn in my deck as a switch out to Bronzong G and, uh, couldn't find it for a long time. So, uh, they were basically able to build up a Honchcrow level X with a ton of special darks. And, uh, then they popped good old cessation crystal on. So cessation crystal is one of the scariest things I could come up against because it shuts off healing from Garchomp, shuts off draw from Staraptor and Claydol. Like I said, my supporters are kind of trash. So uh, it's all in on trying to get those abilities off to make sure my deck is working. And Cessation Crystal just says no to all that stuff. Can't use Bronzong, can't use Skun Tank massively as well, which was a huge, like I keep saying, a huge part of my damage output. And the Honchkrow level X is Darkness Wing. And when it takes a knockout, you're able to get a card back from your discard pile. And Mike has a very, very scary combo. He has Versus Seeker and Pokemon Center Lady. So... When my damage output is shoddy because I can't use Skun Tank with a crystal in the active and he is able to recover Versus Seeker Center Lady, it essentially becomes a brick wall that I can't beat. Uh, so um, that early Night Song Murkrow just gave Mike so much time to chill out, do whatever he wanted, build up this Honchkrow and it's an unmo- like I literally can't beat that combination if he's able to get the PCL versus seeker in hand so that's when i go back and say i would have loved to have dangerous drill i would have loved to have any hand disruption at all <laughs> those cards would have been really really good for me in this exact situation which was again a small oversight from me really um but yeah mike had some insane cards he even had things like e-hammer that had to try and dodge and weave around he had a decent draw engine on his part he had shaman and jirachi and he had backup porygon so uh they had a really really good draft essentially um but it was solo honchkrow that uh that bodied me pretty much um i think i started out the gates fairly early in in the second game that we had <clears throat> but he was able to twins into um the combo pieces to build that honchkrow up and the honchkrows sit at 90 hit points so i can't just deal with it all in one garchomp snipe obviously uh in any easy way and again it's a it's a matter of getting that cessation crystal in the active and just ruining me with a spam of darkness wings so uh just in general the fact that he had dark claw expert belt kakui the number of special darks that he played the stadium meant that he could reach on pretty much anything every turn so he was always getting back a versus seeker effect um to pcl over and over so yeah mike's deck was extremely scary and uh pretty much bodied me for an o2 loss for me putting me down into the loser's bracket because it's a double a limb so fighting through the losers, I come up against a, another SP-based deck. This is a spread-based build uh, with Davi here playing Gallade, also having two Cresselia level Xs, which is a very, very powerful card. Um, you can 
Move one counter from one of your Pokemon to one of your opponents, which is very, very strong. Um, also has the Shining Eyes Azelf, which does a ton of spread across the board as well. Has uh, Luxray, which can bring things up off the bench, which is obviously very annoying because um, I have no switch outs and I only have that one poker turn. So when that's gone, uh, the Bronzong becomes really chunky, Skuntank really chunky, and obviously Claydol is always going to have that two retreat cost, which is expensive to get out of. Uh, Davi also has double poker turn and a Cerola, so a ton of healing on his side as well as my side. Uh, so it was very, very grindy games. Uh, we had a best of three series. I lost one game because he just established early crystal on me on like turn two. And uh, he was able to blade storm then just shining eyes a bunch, I believe it was, um, to like kill basically everything uh, over a couple of turns as I just drew past or just hit for 30 or something like that on the ace health because there was a station crystal in the active. So that was a really rough loss um, of, of one of the games, but we were able to uh, squeak that one out in a couple of the others. Um, I think ultimately it's just the power of Garchomp being able to heal off a lot of the damage that he was setting up. I also think Davi had a kind of a rough time of getting the Cresselia into play in the first place. I, I think if he was able to get um, a Cresselia level X set up in uh, one of the games that I was able to win, um, to sort of sit on board for a longer time, just to milk that sort of value, he would have had the upper hand against me. But I think I was just able to undo too much damage and he ended up having... Well, I was able to do 80 damage into 30 damage quite easily, like just too often for his level Xs. Whereas if he if he was able to skew that math with Cresselia over the turns, would have been a much closer series. But yeah, his deck was very scary as well. He also had that Cessation Crystal. He had Eviolite. So a ton of scary combos in there, especially when you can eco arm them back. I think in game three, he just wasn't able to access the eco arm early enough kind of thing. If, if he would found eco arm and reestablished the cessation crystal again my deck sort of comes to a grinds to a halt kind of thing um it, it's a lot harder to deal with early in the game than it is late because i've probably thinned a lot of cards i've already naturally drawn a lot of cards at that point um and i have things like scott that can naturally get me all the supporters into my hand essentially um but still it would have stopped me being able to like spam bronzong and all that stuff and obviously healing a bunch with the garchomp c level x's so um, yeah, scary deck from Davi, and uh, we had a really close series, um, even using that Uzi level X to do some deep balance knockouts all over the place. Yeah, some, some really cool stuff going on, um, but yeah, just able to squ uh, scrape through that one. In around six, we're up against, or losers round six, I should say, we have Best Pal Al. He's playing, again, a spread-based archetype. That Shining Isaiah's Elf is just, like, way too powerful. Uh, that is worth building around. You can see that many people have gone for that approach. Um, Al is playing the Damage Bind Ampharos, which was potentially very scary as well because it's essentially a cessation crystal that sits on the board, <laughs> um, which is scary because of the amount of hit points that it has and he could leave it out of, out of range. But this was actually a very quick series for me. Again, we're back into that situation where Skuntank can just run riot with poison. There's a ton of 60 and lower hit point Mareeps. So I was killing a lot of things. Uh, the Chatot was getting dealt with early just through poison damage counter ticks going on, as well as like just 30 damage pokes from Garchomps. I was able to 80 damage ping Flaffies before they were becoming Ampharos. So um was able to get through Al in a fairly quick 2-0. Um, I think the matchup was actually closer than it looked, but he just didn't have some very good hands. He was never able to pop off with a candy combo into a stage two. He was always slow evolving uh, through Flaffies, and I was able to deny a number of those throughout our series. So, uh, yeah, when he wasn't able to actually develop damage bind in either of the games that we had, um, it just meant that I was able to execute my strategy like to the best of my ability. And when I have Skuntank online, it's just an inherent advantage that I have against anyone else. So, yeah, that was a quick 2-0 against Al there. So then we make it through to losers' finals. We're up against Odysseus. He has a very interesting deck. Again, taking advantage of SP Pokemon seemed to be the theme for all these people who were still in the tournament compared to those who fell uh, earlier on. Uh, this time, Odysseus is playing uh, some big, healthy basics. He's playing Suicune and Cresselia, which both are 100 hit, 110 hit point Pokemon that have 70 heal 30. They also have Blessings of the Deep Manaphy, which also heal for 20 to one of your Pokemon that has Water Energy attached. Now, Odysseus wasn't actually attacking with these too much because of the poison that I could represent with Skuntank. So it was mostly here weaving in and out of Luxray and Palkia plays. Game one, he had a really atrocious start with just the Celebration Wind Shaman that I was able to donk very quickly. 
but the game two took about an hour and let me tell you it was a grind odysseus has hard charm eviolite uh poker turn as well as uh, Seeker and Mr. Briny's Compassion. So a ton of healing effects. Also, some scary damage mods. Seeing as though I was putting um, Verbank City into play, uh, he had one laser and he also had Giovanni's Scheme. So in a lot of situations, I was getting poked for like 30, just with like Luxray or getting hit for 20 with like Splashing Turn and stuff like that. And I was constantly in fear of getting one bombed just by a combination of laser plus, you know, a certain type of energy or something like that to... Uh, body me also had to be concerned about my bench at times because lost cyclone was always on the table from the palkia g level x so yeah it was a really back and forth series odysseus's deck is really interesting because he plays so many energies i think it's 19 energy total that he plays so it looks like he's bricking the entire time if you if you watch through the series but that's kind of how his deck is built and in many ways he's actually a, a deck out strategy it doesn't look like it naturally um but he can buy so much time with like Rosa Raid and Suicune pushing things to the bench, forcing your opponent to pay retreat on things they don't want to attack with all the time. Um, just slowly grinding away with Aurora gain and with Moonlight gain, the two attacks that do 70 heal 30, Manaphy healing things off the bench all the time. Uh, so yeah, th there's just a ton of like a, a really big resource war and a really interesting one to go over. There were some really unintuitive, difficult plays that I had to make throughout that series to actually win the game. Had to do things like knock out my own clay doll just so that it wasn't a bench target later on with Luxray. Um, had to do some other weird and wonderful plays um, to really keep up in that game. And it was not only a, a, a close prize race where we were at two to one, where I was just slightly ahead, uh, but also I had exactly enough energies to win the game in the end. He almost was able to grind me out through you know, a combination of knockouts and me having to spend energy to retreat or to attack with, with uh, Garchomp, as obviously they discard the uh, DCs if I want to Dragon Rush. So very close series. Again, the SP Pokemon just made my damage output very, very poor. Let me tell you, I would have had such an easier time if I just played Bla uh, Black Belt <laughs> or if I just played um, Dangerous Thrill once again, because at any point getting rid of a Hard Charm or an Eviolite would have meant that I could have like one shot things like Suicune with Poison plus Dragon Rush. So man, my my day would have been so much easier if I had just drafted that slight bit differently. Or well, sorry, uh, built my deck slightly differently. I, I had those cards available. I just chose not to play them. Uh, so yeah, that was uh, a really close series once again in Losers Finals. So Essentially, Odysseus had just lost to Mike Gibbs. So Mike Gibbs was once again waiting for me in the finals. No surprise here because his deck was consistent and had very, very strong game plans uh, with that Darkness Wing being a real ace in the hole for him when he had drafted such good cards like Comp Search and Versus Seeker and uh, things like Junkarm as well, giving him flexibility. So yeah, and honestly, the finals were very boring and uh, not much fun for either side. Game one, I'm able to donk in like three turns just by getting through like a Porygon, a Riolu, and a Murkrow, I think it was, with early Garchomp. Game two, um, I end up keeping a hand, which I, in hindsight, really shouldn't have done. I kept a hand because I had Winona, but I was actually starting a Skuntank, and I had no way to get Skuntank out of the active, so I had to attach an attack with it over a couple of turns, so I definitely should have Gentleman's Mulliganed that instead and given myself a better chance of just having a better starter. Initially, when I saw the Winona, I thought like, okay, we're cooking. I can get into Garchomp and Staraptor quickly, um, but the Skuntank was the big reason why I wasn't able to tempo out and Mike was able to get on top quite quickly, and... Uh, in game three, Mike basically just pops off. He, um, I have, again, a pretty bad start. I start Baltoy as well. Um, so I don't have one of my 10 free retreaters, <laughs> which is a bit annoying. Um, but yeah, it means that uh, I, I early game attach like a DC to the bench that he is able to draw into E-Hammer, as well as establishing turn two Porygon two for backup to draw cards. Uh, he was also able to, um, I think, like comp search into some big cards as well. So he was just able to establish that Honch Crow and pretty much uh, drew everything he needed to off of an N in the early turns. Um, so once his deck is established, I already know that I simply have no win condition because I can't beat the crystal combo with a powered up Honch Crow is essentially the long and short of it. Uh, as soon as I saw that PCL was there, I was scooping essentially. And uh, he was able to set up an early feint attack play on me, which just put damage on Garchomp. And I'd already had 
because that e-hammer i had no energy in play and clay was still stuck active so i was still like three turns behind from even responding on this haunch crow and at that point he was darkness winging and faint attacking like all across my board and crystal would have uh, denied any healing with garchomp as well so that damage was sticking and gonna be like a huge pain so i just scooped it up after like two turns because mike's deck popped off and when it does it should always beat mine so yeah uh, sad to see Mike in the finals. Essentially, Odysseus was my only hope to have beaten Mike. I think Odysseus would have had a slightly better time against Mike than I would have. Still difficult because the amount of damage mods that Mike actually plays makes it quite difficult for Odysseus, which is more on that tanking approach. Um, but still possible for him. So yeah, I was really rooting for Odysseus in, uh, in winners finals. But then again, I would have had to face Mike at any point anyway. So uh, yeah, uh, a fun interaction there. But uh, essentially, Mike just built a very, very good deck and got a lot of the pieces he needed to make it difficult for me. So yeah, uh, that's my run got second place lost in the grand finals to Mike, the only player to beat me throughout the tournament. Uh, the only other person who took a game off me actually was Davi with his spread uh, Gallade deck. Um, so yeah, some good games overall. I think the Garchomp deck overall performed very well. Um, the cube itself was fun to play. Uh, some combos that you don't always see in draft. Um, basically, I only played against one stage two deck and then just a number of SP matchups or decks that were stage one plus SP, which I'm not sure is intentional. Um, there's obviously a big lean towards level X's in the cube, which makes the SP Pokemon already very strong. Um, so I think in terms of like a rebalancing, I think maybe you either raise the power of the stage twos or you kind of reduce the power of the basics and SPs that are available because as Odysseus showed and the number of SP decks that were late on in the tournament shows that, um, they were able to compete damage wise and with the number of hit points that they had and just their flexibility and early tempo, they essentially have no downside compared to drafting stage twos. Uh, the only good thing about having a stage two is like we saw from a best pal al he was able to get things like three candies and a very thick line of ampharos it's because basically they're always open because no one's taking stage twos in the draft so you know that if you want to play a stage two you'll basically be able to wheel stuff and actually accumulate those cards quite easily but that's essentially because they're underpowered compared to the the basics that were available i think just off the top of my head that the my way cresselia the suicune uh, one of the Regigigas is insane. Potentially, the maybe two of the Regigigas are insane compared to other things. And then just a ton of the SP Pokemon are on a ridiculous power level um, compared to some of the Stage 2s. So uh, I do think that's something to to look back on and maybe tweak as he goes. Slight had tweaked his cube beforehand, and it's still a work in progress. So this isn't meant to be like a dig at him or anything, but uh, every cube builder wants to know the weaknesses and what to improve on on their draft because they want to make the cube the best experience possible for everyone so hopefully this constructive criticism is welcomed uh but yeah and i think the last point really uh maybe it's because it's i'm coming over from high power level cubes where you can draw a lot and do a lot of things but i had a number of games finish quite quickly yes i was playing an aggressive rush style deck but some people were just draw passing into me like quite often um and that's really down to me having a draw engine and them not having a draw engine because there was only two clay dolls only two delcatties one porygon 2 and one star raptor fb level lex it meant that anyone who had those just did so much better than anyone else because they were able to set up just way better throughout the game and just never ran out of fuel whereas people um who didn't have those even if they had very very good supporter cards they'd just draw into a bad hand at one point or they'd supporter into not a supporter kind of thing and although they'd have a couple good spiky turns here and there they'd fizzle and um a lot of their situational cards they weren't able to pick out at the right times um and that might be something to work on i personally love everyone having a ton of draw options uh, but i'm from a place where i play high power so everyone needs to draw a lot of cards to get out of sticky situations because they can be put into awkward spots so quickly by high power level cards and even though this is like a medium power cube, I do think that there's enough early game basics to justify having more draw engine Pokemon that are draftable. I think off the top of my head, things like Kabutops and Alakazam are the things to sort of take back to the drawing board and open up space for maybe some more universal draw engines. Um, so yeah, that would be something to look at. I don't think necessarily increasing like the lines of Delcati or Claydol make too much sense maybe looking at just some alternative stage one options for draw power even things like night sight from um 
Noctals or possibly having a Dodrio line that can be a combination of free retreat options as well as um, <coughs> some eco draw, draw one options. I think uh, Dodrio could do quite well in this cube and uh, makes a lot of sense to me just thinking about it off the top of my head. But yeah, those are really the only criticisms I had overall. Uh, some really unique combos, some fun stuff going on. Um, so yeah, really enjoyed it. And if you guys enjoyed the chat about the Champions Cube, you can make sure you go ahead and check out the Legend Box Facebook group. There's also from that Facebook group, you're able to find a Discord channel, which is where we have uh, a ton of smaller tournaments as well as usually uh, monthly tournaments or tournaments that happen ev uh, every six weeks, I think it is roughly, um, as well as some team challenges. There's a ton of different ways to get involved in the Cube League. It's a lot of fun. You can accumulate points that then gets you into the next Champions Cube as well. So I hope you enjoyed my ramble about my deck. Let me know what you guys thought about it. How would you have drafted differently? What did you think was going to do well from the draft and my pre-match tactics? Uh, how lucky was I to have picked up an early Garchomp? <laughs> I'll hear it all down below. Uh, thanks so much for watching, guys, and I'll see you in another video tomorrow. Cheers.